Welcome to the young go. We got lots of dreams. We got a bunch of fun and stuff. We're never gonna let you sleep. That's right. Welcome to the young goal. And from Axel Rose to Ira Glass, welcome to the young and the restless. Um, this is our part two in our conversation with Steve Earn and Wine from The Dreams That Shape Us uh, in, in a, a four-part series that I'm calling uh, Shadowboxing, Jungian Shadowboxing Extravaganza Extraordinaire. If you didn't listen to, actually, we, we, you saw that this was called part two. Why would you skip straight to this one? What are you doing? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to explain myself again. This is part two. And uh, if you want to know why the break in the format, go listen to part one, you silly goose. Anyway, I'm sorry about this whole intro. And uh, on with part two with Steve Ernanwine. No, I was reading down to sleep. I dreamt I had a soul to keep in the fire. I flew away for a dream. Something that, uh, that Zach said a while ago, I don't remember what the context was exactly, but um, to paraphrase, um, we, we were talking about the idea that like your, your dreams are trying to tell you something, your dreams are trying to tell you something. And um, Zach kind of challenged that idea of like, well, why do we operate as if like our subconscious knows the answers to everything, right? And like, I like when I when I first was thinking about that, I was like, whoa, what do you mean? Of course, of course it does. But when you examine that a little bit more, it's a it's a really good question. It's like when we t- when we I, we all like through our various practices and our, our like me and Zach with dream interpretation and you with uh, your, your dream exploration. I don't I, I think it is interpretation, but it like, it's, it's its own thing. But, um, like we're all kind of assuming that there is like wisdom and deeper knowledge buried in our dreams. But like, what do we think that is? Like, is it, is it the idea that there's a part of yourself that has all the answers that knows how you should be living and how you should operate. And it's just like cut off from you at all times. Is there like, is there like a, 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 a perfect victor, like buried under all the layers of shit that knows all the answers. <laughs> and I just need to, I just, I'm trying, trying to have a conversation with that guy all the time. Is it like, do we like Steve, do you believe like that you're communicating with like, uh, something outside of yourself that is that is like giving you information that like you don't have within you and you're reaching out to that outside thing or like what do we all think that is or is it bullshit mm. I don't know you think that's why I get stuck on the at the self-awareness part and that's where I think each of us on our on our podcast have gotten frustrated at times by having the same for me it's like work dreams I'll be like We'll get into something. I'll be like, oh, this is another dream about my professional life, and then that gets sure. like, tiresome. And I, I think it's tiresome because I feel stuck at that like self awareness part, where like, like I, okay, I know that this is a thing for me. What what do I do about it? But then I don't know. The the wisdom of the unconscious makes sense to me when it's pointing out a problem because I think there are uh, a lot of things that we all have that we know we have somewhere, but we don't want to admit it even a little bit at a conscious level. And so when that gets pointed out in a dream, that makes perfect sense. But sometimes it is like it's mm-hmm. wisdom beyond that. I feel like when it, when it is more solution based and not just pointing out a problem. Yeah. And so, yeah, I guess I was just echoed Victor's question. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it is Victor? I, I think like I've heard some crazy stories, right? And a, a, a few of in the same way that I'm like, I you hear you hear you hear ghost stories. I got my ghost story. A lot of people have ghost stories. Ninety nine percent of them, it's like oh, I can I can see like a rational explanation for that. I can I can construct a way to dismiss that. And then every now and then you'll hear something where it's like I don't really know what the answer is there. I don't really think this person is lying. So I feel like something weird happened. And um. 
I feel like you'll hear those stories with dreams, right? Where it's like someone had some information that where I don't see how they could have gotten it any rational way. And yet they had that information. The idea that it just came to them like as like a random firing of neurons that just so happen to coincide with an event is like, yeah, I, su- I suppose like the one in a billion chance thing happened. Uh, but but it doesn't, it, that rings false to me, right? So mm. I think 99% of the time it's you communicating with your own, with your own subconscious. Um, and then maybe every now and then you connect with something else. And I don't know what that something is. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, that leaves me with like, okay, so why is my subconscious holding on to, why can't that just be my conscious? Why, why, why can't my conscious mind be like on top of everything? Why, why do I have to uh, constantly be trying to connect the dots of my own like, you know, foolish behavior, you know? Where would the fun be in that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I like that, dude. Um, where do you land? Do you think, do you think, okay, I say 99% of the time, it's just your own mind. You say 98% of the time, it's just your own mind. 95. Where do you land? See, before I started my podcast, I would have said 95% of the time, at least it's just your own psychological inner workings. Um, some of the stories that we've gotten, it seems like some people's dreaming lives are just geared differently. Mm. <laughs> it seems like everybody interfaces with their dreams in a unique way that if you engage it, potentially has a very special and unique relationship, um, which is beautiful. I like, I, I really appreciate that about dreams. Um, it can be kind of frustrating from a certain standpoint of like, not being able to pin them down can be frustrating. Mm. Like as much as I feel like I can speak to what dreams are and how they operate being 18 years in the tank with them. But every time I, every time I think I'm getting clever and I can pin them down, then uh, they s- surprise the hell out of me in a way that I can't explain. Mm. Or I hear stories about people's dreams that are so far like, way off base from how my dreams usually operate with me that I'm like, well, what the hell is that? Like, how do you explain that? Uh, but I, yeah, I, to, to talk about at least the wisdom part of it, I, uh, I think I read something that I don't know who said this or what kind of validity it has, but it was something along the lines of the unconscious mind has been developed over some hundreds of thousand years i don't know what the number was i can't remember that it that it has more range than our little puny conscious mind could ever fathom just like we we genetically and i guess that's what carl jung's collective unconscious notion is all about is that we are all endowed the collective reservoir where however that works of human experience and that somehow it filters into our unco- our personal unconscious so there's like the collective unconscious and then there's the personal and so you have in Carl Jung's I- ideology you have access to the totality of the collective human experience from time in a, whatever the hell that word is yeah immemorial I think yeah. is what they say, and I've never I've never heard that word in any other in, context. Yeah. What the immemorial is that? Am I making that in, up? Am I wrong about that? Memory, uh, or um, yeah, I can, I can never remember, and I feel like an idiot every time yeah. I go to say it's it. It's immemorial. I m m e m o r i a l. Be Latin. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, and that's wild to me, like that, and just knowing. A lot of the dreams that I have had that I really got to the root of what they were trying to communicate to me. It's just, it there's a perfection to the way in which the dream packaged it that is so utterly and almost unbelievable 
that like how did you take like how i don't know i'm so speechless when i start to talk about it because it's like it not only like takes associations from your life but it there's synchronicities that sometimes are included in it all kind of like what you and Liv experienced with the whole conception of your baby thing like fucking like how does how does how does it interface and work not only with your own internal landscape but it works in tandem with actual waking occurrences that haven't even happened yet that are about to come into your life that give meaning to it or like give more context to it and as you break it apart you're just like where am i all of a sudden like life has this magic to it and this mystery to it that you just can't even explain and so i think i think there is like a deeper wisdom latent within all of us and i don't know exactly what to call that or where that comes from uh but it seems like i guess i guess to me i don't like the word god so much but the creative force that moves through this universe that is very visible in our waking lives whatever that is whatever that thing is that's in you that beats your heart that keeps saying yes to life dave that's that, dave that's dave <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, uh, one of my favorite dream workers, uh, rest in peace, Mary Jo. She she passed away a year and a half ago. Her dad called God Davy. Oh really? Oh, that's yeah. cool. So that was really sweet. And I was actually talking to her husband tonight. So that's actually a really sweet little synchronicity of its own. Hmm. While I'm talking about it, um, yeah, I just I don't know what to call that. Maybe the soul has a, a certain wisdom to it that it comes into this world with. I don't know. Or maybe it is just the greater soul of humanity and that collectivity that there's a fountain of of wisdom through the ages that is available that but then that doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> I like I like the idea of like the creative force that moves through this world. That it it's moving through you all the time, growing your hair, beating your heart, fucking growing your cells. We don't even have to think about this kind of shit. It just happens. There's there is a creative force in all of us, and that if it knows how to create all of this, there must be some wisdom there that is latent within it, is nascent within it. That that mind of nature, I guess, to circle back to that, that it just fucking knows. I don't know. <laughs> Whoa, dude! <laughs> I felt like I just like went on a ride there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I where I stand on the. 99%, 1%. I was going to ask. It uh, <clears throat> it does feel like sometimes the, the universe or something, something's like showing off or like making itself known because I do feel like I get like stuck in the idea that, or, or tend to live in, in, the, in the space that the dreams are. And I don't know, I feel like maybe I can be kind of a self-centered person and, and, and dreams are like the most personal thing there is like, no one else can dream them for you. Uh, so it fe- it, like intuitively to me feels like just you on you. But then every now and then something fucking weird happens. <laughs> like I, while we're talking about this, I, I it, it brought up this memory. I, I think I talked to Victor and Olivia about it in our early days, but it was like before we started like making publishable content. <laughs> it was like during our practice, our practice <laughs> uh, days. Uh, so I don't think it ever ended up on the show, but I had this dream uh, a while back where I was in Florida and I have a good friend that lives in Florida and I was like, oh, I should call Alex. And so I found a payphone and I, I called Alex and his uh, mom answered and she was like, oh, he's not here right now. He's he's off in uh, Georgia. And uh, I woke up and I was just thinking about Alex and I hadn't texted him in a while. So I was like, hey, dude, I just had a dream that I was in Florida, but 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 you weren't there and he was like oh it's funny you say that i'm actually in atlanta right now <laughs> uh, wow and it's like that's you know that's a neighboring state it's not like that but it was it felt very weird it felt yeah. like i something else told me that alex was in georgia when i was trying to find him in florida and i don't know what that is <laughs> yeah collect collective like, unconscious you, you... makes sense although i have a hard time wrapping my head around what that is even 
like if if it's your mission to like dismiss everything like that you can be like oh uh, coincidence you came across you subconsciously absorbed some information that he was going to do that or somehow you knew and you forgot or because like you're like you can always work back from the premise of like well you like that meaning anything is impossible so something else happened that, that is meaningless because everything's meaningless. That's but no uh, fun. I don't think that that's a fun way to operate. You know, that's not who wants to who wants to hang out with that guy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. See, that, that kind of comes. I know you guys like the Bob Oz episode that we did. Yeah. And that to me is kind of like. Like his his whole notion of the body unconscious network that. Like, that's what he told the woman. So this woman had a dream about him. They don't know each other. And Bob Bob tells her that he's communicating to her through the body unconscious network. And this is a message that he has for himself. <laughs> and he, he delivers this message. And so then she gets on the Google the next day, types in the name Bob Haas, and knew that he was from Arizona, like that was included in the dream. Types all that in. First thing that pops up is Bob's dream working website. He's from Arizona. And she's like, what the heck? <laughs> and so she emails him and was like, dude, I had this dream about a Bob Haas from Arizona. And I see that you work with dreams. So I thought I would give you, I would tell you the dream. And sure enough, it, it was a message for him that he actually was really struggling with. And uh, so that kind of stuff is like, how do you explain that? Um and so kind of like what you just talked about, Zach, like this is an information that you have, but maybe in some weird way, like we're more deeply connected with each other than we even know. Yeah. And for whatever reason, maybe your dreams wanted to give you an example or like kind of what you're saying, like show off, like there is something deeper and spookier that is happening between all of us. And I'm going to make you question everything now. <laughs> I don't know. See, that's like going into the podcast. Like I was like, I thought I had a pretty good handle, but hearing stories like that, that we have, it's just wild. It's really, really crazy. Is that, um, is that the craziest story that, that uh, you've heard on your podcast in your opinion? Or, or what is the craziest story you've heard? Like talking to so many people about their experiences. Or even just something else that you you've come across and like you're exploring this topic for so long. I would say it's definitely the the thing that's like most striking about his story in particular is that there's like synchronicity on top of synchronicity on top of synchronicity yeah. for him mm -hmm. within the scope of that story. Like it's not just that some random woman emailed him saying that she had a dream about him. Like there was there was like three other synchronicities that were attached to this moment that really makes it the thing that it was for him. Uh, so that was like one of the more wild stories of synchronicity I'd ever heard. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I've ever heard a more like unexplainable story of synchronicity, like the the complexity and just the layeredness of it. How do you top that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. A um, uh, couple of the, there, there's definitely been quite a few other stories that are really really wild one of them in particular i'm thinking about is uh uh it's by a man named matt cochran he's a good friend of mine now uh he uh he had this beautiful dream where he had an antelope approach him it was just a silhouette at first in like a twilight landscape and as it got closer the silhouette revealed itself to be this pronghorn antelope and it was just a very short very quick dream but the exchange that happened between them locking eyes with each other was so intense and carried so much grief uh, for him that he woke up and he was just utterly shocked by it. Uh, and then he was like, the only thing that I knew to do was to try to figure out how to get closer to antelope to like try to understand like what this, what this was. And so <clears throat> he ends up going on this retreat in in this Great Salt Lake, there's an island called Antelope Island, and he went to a retreat on it, and there's a there's like a range where there's a whole bunch of antelope on it. And while he's there, he decides to go up on this ridge where he saw some antelope the day before, and he, 
he said he was drumming a little bit and he felt like a, a fraud and he was just like trying to call the antelope in and he he was like i felt so dumb that half an hour later i just like decided to to go pack it up and, and head back and he's like i went up to the ridge one last time and when i got up to the ridge there was a pronghorn antelope about 15 feet away from me and he's like and it just wrecked me the same way it did in the dream and he's like i was just bawling and it just like a tsunami wave of grief uh just broke free inside of me and uh the story continues on to it's it's just a wild wild story but to have his dream become such a waking dream was just so utterly gorgeous to me and uh yeah i don't know i i would encourage you to <laughs> to go and to track that that episode down because it it just continues to go and understanding the antelope more and his connection to them and uh his connection to wild nature and, and landscape and uh, uh basically the antelope came in service of him working through his grief and uh that he had been carrying for a long time and there was just something about that animal that that really brought it out for him uh that's interesting so yeah yeah, there's just uh, I can't really say that any one of them is is any wilder than the next. I think all of them really showcase beautifully just like how meaningfully dreams can come in and intersect your life and uh, really have a really profound impact on you moving forward. And that's it's, yeah. that's sort of like the uh, inverse of of dream incubation. Like instead of going back and asking your dream for something, like going out into the out into the real mm. world uh yeah. so far that you go on a retreat to find an antelope that's like that's that's a, that's another interesting <laughs> approach but the flip side yeah and I, I would love for a dream to inspire me that that far to go do something that far out off the beaten path for me because i love when i have um smaller versions of that like mm -hmm. I, I one time dreamed about um donuts they were like fritters filled with pistachio cream and i woke up so obsessed with that idea that i like went to the store and like got the fry oil and i, I made them that day and they were awesome oh man that sounds so good i just i love waking up with that motivation um just cause something in a dream was like like hit you on that like i got i gotta see this through kind of level mm -hmm. uh even if it's a silly it's a donut there is there is like a a school of thought I think maybe Robert Moss is the one who really pushes this, but uh, to kind of <clears throat> to take action on your dreams, like even if it's a small one, kind of like what you did. Who knows why <laughs> the donut dream came to you? But um, if you can take an action based on a dream or based on what you think it's trying to communicate to you, uh, it's a really beautiful way to honor your dreams. Um, the other thing about that too is is to live your dreams forward, which. God, I can't remember who said that. I think that's, uh, can't remember his name. He's a young Ian guy. I almost said Robert Johnson, but I don't think that's right. I think it's uh, somebody else. But yeah, to, to find a way of honoring your dream in a way that you, you live it forward or you like, you find some gesture of, of sorts or I don't even know how to explain it. I wish I had like a, an example off the top of my head, but uh, I guess one example I had was a couple months ago, I had a, I had a dream that I killed somebody. And I did not want to kill say, somebody in honor of that dream. <laughs> then I honored my dream. <laughs> <laughs> I really fucked. I really killed that guy. <laughs> um, yeah, and to me, it was. Uh, I read this book right around that time called "No More Mr. Nice Guy," and uh, it really just pulverized my psyche. It called me out in so many beautiful ways, and uh, felt so validating at the same time. Uh, knowing that I'm not the only nice guy out there who's put himself last and created all kinds of psychic damage within himself because he couldn't set boundaries or <laughs> or uh, know what his needs are or or speak I can up see Victor needs. looking up this um, book right now. That's right, I'm googling <laughs> it, dude. It's it's phenomenal. I, I encourage. I think every man needs to read it, whether they identify themselves as a nice guy or not. And it's or, not to become uh, a jerk. people pleaser, it's, would you say, falls under that category? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I was, absolutely. I was thinking about that the other day of like how I I feel like I'm still getting a 
grip on this and like how it's something I want to be able to teach my kid, but like understanding the difference between being nice and being kind, you know, like right, yeah. being nice shouldn't be your goal. Being kind is, is good, but being nice is usually coming from kind of a weird place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So right around that time I had this dream that I had killed somebody and I was all messed up about it and I didn't even know who it was and it was, it felt like an accident and I knew that I lived in this little small town and like everybody was going to know and they, they were going to turn on me and I was all messed up and I'm like, what do I do? Like, do I turn myself in or do I just skip town? And I, in the dream, I had this really fast car and I knew that if I wanted to, I could just take off. But I got almost to like the city limits and I realized, no, I can't do that. And I went back into town and I turned myself in and the police station where they were holding me was also like the funeral house that they were putting who I killed on display for everybody in the town to come say goodbye to. And so I had to stand there and it was so uncomfortable to know that I did this and have to stand there and take that kind of accountability for it, it was so intense and it was so counter to the nice guy. So I, I was like, I, I'm pretty sure that this dream is the dream about me killing the nice guy <laughs> and everybody in town loved this dude so much. Like, it was really moving to me in the dream to see how much they all loved this. Yeah, he was nice to them. Um, yeah. <laughs> and to me, it, it was so validating after the fact because, you know, after reading the book, I was like, why the fuck have I been living like this? Like, I cannot believe like how ingrained this is into my psyche. Like, how have I survived? And I'm like, never again. I'm never like, I uh, like, had a moment like that where I was just like, uh, how do I get this out? Like, ugh. Yeah. And I, I think that dream like offered the nice guy so much grace. Like, you are where you are right now and you owe so much of it to this guy. Like, how much they loved him felt like such a beautiful show. Like, there was so much good in the nice guy. You can't, don't hate the nice guy. It's good that you killed him. It's going to be good that you killed him. Uh, but it, it gave me that pause of being like, Okay, what was it that he did for me that I can carry forward with me that I'm super grateful for? And there, there's so much there. Uh, but so I did, I took that dream and I wanted to honor it really beautifully. I do this with a lot of the death dreams that I have where I create a ceremony. Uh, oftentimes I'll like create a cardboard coffin, just like a shoebox size coffin. I'll free write a bunch of stuff that I feel like I is associated with it that I want to let go of. And sometimes I'll like really beautify the coffin. Like I'll make it really pretty. I'll make it in a way that I don't want to burn it so that it makes it that much harder and that much more intense when I do burn it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's a way of honoring the death too, to, to really decorate it and, and make it special um, to say goodbye in that kind of sacred way. And yeah, I burned it. It was really powerful and really beautiful. And, and yeah, the last couple of months, I, I feel like I've, not that the nice guy isn't still in there, and I struggle with them all the time, but I'm just so excited for for who I for who I feel like I'm becoming and that I might possibly actually become that guy that I've always wanted to be where I'm not a dick, but I'm also not a floor mat because, god damn, yeah. way too much of my life was spent like that. Man, that would be crazy there. if that's how the justice system works. So, <laughs> Or they hold a trial at the wake of your victim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You must you must bear witness to everyone's grief over this. That would probably be pretty powerful. Just picturing you out there spitting on babies and pushing over old ladies. <laughs> like, yeah, nice guy is dead now. I'm I'm not. I don't have to be the nice guy anymore. <laughs> oh man, it's a self actualization. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting thought that I can't believe I haven't had before about like violent dreams. Because I, I, I have a genre of dream that I'm sure it's come up on our podcast. Um, although I don't know if we've actually done a, a dream like this. But every now and then I have a dream where I just absolutely lose my shit on somebody. Like a level of rage that I, I don't know that I've actually had in real life. Um, well, I definitely haven't because I've never beat anyone up. <laughs> 
but I, I have dreams where I get so mad that I like physically assault uh, somebody in a dream who has wronged me or whatever. Um, and I'll, I'll like wake, I'll like wake up angry. I'll wake up from like the, the physicality of, of what I'm of, like, I'll wake up throwing punches in the air. You know what I mean? Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I haven't figured out how to process. I think I've been on the surface level of that one still where I'm like, that's about some kind of suppressed rage. Like I got to figure out what I'm angry about, but even understanding this long that like most of what what's in, in our dreams is us especially other characters are is just some part of you i don't think i've approached it yet from like who what part of me am i assaulting in that dream mm-hmm. what what am i trying to beat up or kill about about myself yeah yeah what is uh what is underneath anger and rage typically in in those dreams it's like I don't know. Usually what happens in those dreams is, is the person I'm mad at did something like wildly out of line to some, mm-hmm. <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> did something wildly out of line to somebody I, I care about. Like the one that jumps to mind is I was at like some sort of soiree or like function, um, like black tie affair. And this dude put his cigarette out in my mom's drink mm-hmm. and I, I told him to go buy her another one mm-hmm. and he didn't. And so I almost beat him to death. <laughs> and Damn. Yeah, and I just woke up from that like, yikes, there's some <laughs> some part of me that uh, I'm going to have to address someday uh, that's super angry. But <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought about what that guy represents or what. Uh, obviously, that would make you angry if that happened to you, <laughs> somebody disrespecting your mother. Mm-hmm. But but mm-hmm. why that? Why why that in that moment with that guy? What is my subconscious working through there? I don't expect to figure this out right now. I'm just, I'm just musing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the interesting things in that book he talks about is that all nice guys have a really deep reservoir of rage. And it and it typically stems from the fact that they have they have suppressed their own needs and wants and have tailored themselves so fully to other people that they've forgotten all about themselves typically and that that builds over a life a hefty reservoir of resentment and anger and rage and yeah. Yeah. So typically, I, I would think that under underneath rage is some kind of pain, some kind of some kind of grief of some sort that you get the anger first or the rage first because you're touching something really delicate and really soft. And so typically, our, our, we defensively we <laughs> we lash out in anger uh, as a defense mechanism. But if we if you peel it back, I don't know. You could look at I don't know. In that dream in particular, I, I would be curious. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, what your mother would represent to you would probably some some form of nurturing, or mm-hmm. and so I don't know. It could be, it could be representative of some way that stronger personalities or shittier personalities have have kind of soiled your your ability to nurture yourself and your inability to yeah to kind of like that rage comes out because of possibly ways in which <laughs> your own ability to nurture yourself uh maybe has been trampled or disregarded or dismissed or to such a degree that yeah inside of you that's really what you want to do that's the kind of justice that you would want in an act if if there was no <laughs> societal shunning <laughs> around it maybe i don't know yeah it's worth looking at because I don't know if I identify with the uh, Mr. Nice Guy thing as as yeah as much. I, I think I you know I, I have a touch of the people pleases, but not 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 as much as some people. Yeah. Mostly because I, I I don't like confrontation. But like I said a minute ago, I think I can be kind of uh, self centered. So I don't know if I have I have a problem with putting my own wants and desires in the back seat. If anything, I I, I think I lead with them too much in my own thoughts. Mm. Um, so yeah, maybe that's me trying to beat up that part of me that disrespects the nurturing part of me. I don't know. Hmm. I'll have to keep working through this one. Maybe I'll have to incubate it. Yeah. There you go. Thank you for listening to The Young and the Restless Jungian Shadow Boxing Experience Live. Pre-recorded. Part 2. Tune in. 
in two weeks, sweet dreamer. See you, see you then. Love you. Bye. It is a good viewpoint to see the world as a dream. <laughs> And unconscious human beings. Something like a Science is dead and magic is real. Where do do you dreams on fun? What what do they think? We all breathe. Just as we all breathe.